From Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Emilio Madrigal. Today we are excited to kick off a multilingual series introducing the Milan system for salivary gland cytopathology. And I am joined by, today by none other than Dr. William Faquin, who is currently in Boston, Massachusetts, and is a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School, and also the director of head and neck pathology at Massachusetts INEAR. Dr. Faquin is also the co-chair of the Milan system alongside Dr. Esther Diana Rossi. Today, Dr. Faquin will be presenting his talk titled, The Milan System for Reporting Salivary Gland Cytopathology, an update with FNA examples. As always, you're more than welcome to ask questions by typing them as comments right here in the Facebook Live window, and I will make sure to pass those questions along to Dr. Faquin at the end of the session. So with that, I'll now turn the microphone over to Dr. Faquin. Thank you very much, Emilio, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here uh, this afternoon to talk about the Milan system for salivary gland cytopathology. What I'd like to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is uh, start with a little bit of background to salivary gland by needle aspiration, uh, followed by uh, some information about the clinical management of salivary gland tumors. And then we'll talk about some specifics of the Milan system including the diagnostic categories and their definitions. Um, I'll provide some actual FNA examples of each of the diagnostic categories, and we'll finish up by just saying a little bit about ancillary studies that can be used to evaluate salivary gland lesions. To start off with, we know that we're dealing with three major salivary glands. Uh, the parotid gland, submandibular gland, and sublingual gland, but there are also hundreds, if not thousands, of minor salivary glands throughout the um, upper aerodigestive tract. And all of these different salivary glands uh, have the ability uh, to present with uh, pathologies that include uh, various neoplasms, both benign and malignant. This image just shows you four of the different tumors that can be encountered uh, in aspirates of the salivary gland. And uh, one of the challenges that we have with salivary gland cytology is that the salivary gland tumors are among the most heterogeneous groups of neoplasms that there are for, for basically any anatomic site in the body. And therefore, it's one of the most difficult areas of cytopathology. And you might ask yourself, what role is there for salivary gland FNA? So let me just give you a little bit of, of background to FNA of the salivary glands. In terms of sensitivity and specificity, the sensitivity overall is pretty good. We usually hit the lesion and we, we usually get a specimen that we can diagnose. The specificity shows a broader range, however, 48 to 94%. And that's because of the range of different types of tumors that you can encounter, as well as the fact that uh, many of these uh, low-grade uh, cancers have overlapping cytomorphologic features with some of the benign salivary gland tumors. And sometimes it's only by looking histologically for evidence of invasion that we can distinguish it, we distinguish them. Um, however, I will tell you later in this talk that there are some really great ancillary markers that are now available for us to, to apply uh, to these salivary gland aspirates when you have a cell block, for example, that can increase the overall accuracy of salivary gland FNA. We do a fairly good job, though, on salivary gland FNA at distinguishing benign low-grade versus high-grade uh, cancers. Uh, I'd also like to point out in this slide that oftentimes frozen section is used in surgical excisions of salivary gland tumors. And frozen section has its own issues in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and overall accuracy. But if you combine a prior FNA with a frozen section, we actually end up with an accuracy that's higher than either one of those put together. And so this is actually not a bad combination to use, doing your FNA and then also doing a frozen section. Now, how does salivary gland FNA impact clinical management? 
let me start off with this slide just giving you an overview and then i'll tell you a, a little bit more about the specifics so in terms of the rationale for salary land fna number one if we can say that we're dealing with a non-neoplastic lesion then perhaps the patient will just have clinical follow-up if we say on fna that it's either a benign tumor or a low-grade carcinoma the patient's most likely going to have a limited resection of that tumor with negative margins. If we can tell the clinician they're dealing with metastatic disease to, for example, parotid lymph nodes, either intraparotid or periparotid lymph nodes, then the patient's going to have a different management that will usually involve uh, lymph node resection. Also, if we're aspirating a lymphoid lesion from the salivary glands, we can do a lymphoma workup. And if we tell the clinicians it's a, it's a lymphoma, then the patient will go on for a hemonc referral. Very importantly, though, if we classify in a general sense the salivary gland FNA as a high-grade primary carcinoma, it's very likely that the patient is going to go on and have a radical resection of some sort, possibly nerve sacrifice, and possibly a, some form of a selective lymph node dissection. Uh, what I'd like to do is to present a little bit of information uh, courtesy of Dr. Mark Barveras, who's one of our uh, star head and neck uh, surgeons here at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary and the Mass General Hospital. Uh, this is an, uh, uh, an extraction of some of the information that Dr. Barveras presented recently at the annual meeting of the ASC. So, what are the surgeon's priorities, according to Dr. Barberis? Number one, do I need to operate? If an operation is needed, what type of parotidectomy, if we're dealing with a parotid tumor, needs to be done? Are we talking about extracapsular dissection? And uh, this is a form of surgery that um, is done in selected cases. It's getting a, a little more popular these days. Um, superficial parotidectomy, subtotal parotidectomy, and that's when you might have a deep lobe parotid tumor and you don't want to take the entire parotid out. You might do a subtotal or a total parotidectomy. You might also ask, um, the clinician would ask, is a neck dissection necessary? And what is the likelihood that the facial nerve will need to be sacrificed? So these are all important uh, questions that the surgeon will be asking. Let's talk a little bit about the facial nerve. Um, a normally functioning facial nerve is probably not involved uh, by the tumor. Um, and therefore, um, we, we usually will attempt to save that facial nerve, even if it means close margins. For low-grade lesions that are inseparable for the nerve, it may even mean leaving some gross disease behind in order to save the facial nerve. Uh, generally. A definitive cancer diagnosis is warranted before sacrificing the nerve. And this gets at the point where we want to go the extra mile and do the best we can to make a more specific diagnosis on our salivary gland FNA. In general, a nerve that shows abnormal function prior to surgery is probably involved by the tumor and probably cannot be preserved. So what about neck lymph nodes? Uh, gross nodal disease, either clinical or radiographically involved, will require a comprehensive selective neck dissection. Oftentimes, this will be levels two through four, but sometimes it will involve levels one and five, depending upon the tumor and the, and the anatomic location. Also, when the risk of occult nodal metastasis reaches about 20%, generally a prophylactic selective neck dissection uh, will be performed for those patients. So just a few comments from Dr. Varveris that are pertinent for head and neck surgeons in general. Um, again, being as specific as possible with the FNA diagnosis provides the surgeon with the most guidance. For example, salivary gland FNA is not just a screening test, but I, I think uh, we can actually do better and that's where um, having a good FNA, making the proper preparations, and having material for ancillary studies that we'll talk about in a few minutes can be very important. 
So either a specific diagnosis or at the least differenti differentiating your diagnosis into benign slash malignant and low grade versus high grade is important. And then um, if you are dealing with a salivary gland tumor, especially a cancer, um, usually it's important to discuss those in a multidisciplinary tumor board. And that's where we really need to also be at the table as cytopathologists and pathologists. Our input is criti critical as part of the overall team. All right, let's start talking about this uh, uh, possibility of a new reporting system. And it's more than a possibility. We actually have an atlas that will be published in early January, uh, just uh, in a couple months. So can a new reporting system for salivary gland uh, cytology be effective? All right, why do we need a reporting system? And it gets at the heart of current reporting confusion. Um, you know, depending upon which institution uh, where you're working, there's a diversity of, di of diagnostic categories that are used. Um, sometimes only descriptive reports are being used without any diagnostic categories at all. Sometimes using surgical pathology terminology instead of cytology terminology. And currently there's no real correlation between a cytology diagnosis and a risk of malignancy or with uh, necessarily with a management algorithm. Uh, there's general agreement out there among cl uh, treating clinicians, as well as among uh, cytopathologists, that we need a defined set of diagnostic categories for salivary gland FNA, because it will provide clarity of communication between cytopathologists, between cytologists and patholog surgical pathologists, and between pathology, cytology, and the treating clinician, as well as helping in the exchange of data across institutions. And with this in mind, we have come up with the Milan system for reporting salivary gland cytopathology. The reason it's called the Milan system is because we had the first uh, meeting, face-to-face -face meeting of our core task group or task force for the for the Milan system at the uh, uh, the annual meeting of the European Cytology Congress in Milan, Italy, back in 2015. So um, my hats off to Dr. Dan Curtis, who is very very um, helpful in um, setting up uh, the uh, um, online surveys that were performed. And there were two of them that were performed prior to deciding upon the criteria that would be uh, encompassed within the Milan system. Uh, the online surveys had 49 specific questions in this first one related to taxonomy, practice, and diagnostic entities. We had over 515 uh, international participants answering the first survey. Um, and the answer is just to summarize a few of the, uh, uh, the answers that we got. Overall, there was majority support for the development of a uniform reporting system. It was interesting because we found that a majority of uh, respondents use radiologic guidance for their FNAs. Um, a majority of respondents use both air dried and alcohol fixed preparations, which in my opinion is very, very important to have because there's certain salivary gland tumors, the matrix producing ones, certain ones with cytoplasmic qualities like vacuoles that you can see in a cynic cell carcinoma, where you really need both air dried and alcohol fixed preparations. Uh, and if you don't have both of those, I think you are actually putting some limits on your ability to diagnose some of these salivary gland tumors. It was a little bit disappointing, though, that only 62% of respondents use ancillary studies for salivary gland FNA. And I think we need to work to uh, increase that percentage because using ancillary studies, and we have a lot of nice ones available these days, we can actually go further and do better with our salivary gland FNAs. So before I talk about some of the specifics of the Milan system, I would just like to say thank you, and I'm sure this comes from uh, my co-editor, Dr. Deanna Rossi as well. Thank you to the American Society of Cytopathology, as well as the IAC, who uh, sponsored um, our work on this, 
as well as to the many contributors, the many co-authors um, who have worked very hard to make the Milan system for reporting salivary gland cytopathology possible. And I'd also like to give special thanks to Emilio Madrigal for his leading role in the social media aspects of the Milan system. So in terms of uh, uh, the Milan system, again, it was co-sponsored by the ASC and the IAC, and we have over 40 co-authors of the Atlas representing over 15 countries. So it's truly an international effort. Our goal is to produce a practical classification system that is user-friendly. It can be used by the everyday practicing cytopathologist and one that's internationally accepted. We also want this system to be evidence-based um, and to correlate with the management algorithm. And I think we've achieved all of these goals. The print atlas, as I mentioned earlier, um, will be available in January 2018. So we're just a couple of months away from the print atlas. And subsequently, there will also be a web-based atlas. And um, Dr. Curtix is very involved in setting this up which will have hundreds of images available through the ASC website. This is just an image we had uh, of our, um, um, one of our face-to-face -face meetings at the last USCAP meeting where we were discussing details of the Milan system. And we had several of these face-to-face uh, -face meetings among our co-authors involved in writing the Milan system atlas. So here are the important diagnostic categories. There are six of them. Number one, non-diagnostic. Number two, non-neoplastic. Number three, atypia of undetermined significance. Number four, neoplasm. And that's divided into two groups, benign and uncertain malignant potential. Number five is suspicious for malignancy. And number six is malignant. And what I'm gonna do is take you through each of these diagnostic categories, tell you what the criteria are, and give you some examples. Before we do that, though, this is a very important table, which is in Chapter 1, uh, which is uh, the lead authors are Dr. Baloche and Dr. Andrew Field. Uh, this is a, a key table showing the risk of malignancy and a basic summary of the management algorithm for each of the diagnostic categories. Um, and you'll note that aside from the non-diagnostic category, where I think oftentimes, basically, they just did not get a good sample of the lesion, and some of these are malignant, but starting at non-neoplastic and moving upwards uh, towards malignant, you can see that in general, the percent risk of malignancy increases. And these are the mean risks of malignancy based on um, a detailed review of the literature. Uh, but notice, this is very important, that the neoplasm benign category um, is associated with a less than 5% risk of malignancy. And this is very important because some of these patients will decide to have clinical follow-up rather than going on for surgery. The Milan System Atlas is organized into 10 chapters. The first chapter presents an overview of the diagnostic terminology and reporting. Then chapters two through seven cover each of the six diagnostic categories in detail. And then chapter eight is an ancillary studies chapter. The lead author is Dr. Pastazari, followed by chapter nine on clinical management and followed uh, by the last chapter, chapter 10, on histologic considerations, which is written by Dr. Bruce Winnig. So let's start with the non-diagnostic -diagn category. Uh, this category is defined as having insufficient quantitative or qualitative cellular material to make a cytologic diagnosis. We would hope that the non-diagnostic rate would not exceed about 10%. And in general, now we don't have um, uh, details of this from the literature, but in general, we feel that similar adequacy criteria to those used for the thyroid Bethesda system, that is 60 lesional cells, would be a reasonable estimate um, or a ballpark estimate to use when you're assessing a salivary gland FNA. So let me just give you a very brief FNA uh, vignette. This is a 50-year-old woman who presents with right, right facial pain. 
keep in mind that any patient presenting with uh, nerve symptoms, uh, in general, they are almost always assumed to have a cancer until proven otherwise. Um, the patient has a one centimeter right parotid mass, which is detected by CT. Uh, the nodule, though, is very difficult to detect by palpation. An FNA of this right parotid mass was performed in the clinical office. Here's the FNA, and it shows uh, these clusters in the upper left and in the lower right of well-defined lobules of benign non-neoplastic acinar cells and these nice acinar um, lobular arrangements. There are some benign looking non-neoplastic ductal elements present here. Here's another image that shows these grape-like clusters of uh, non-neoplastic benign acinar cells and background adipose tissue. So what is your FNA diagnosis? And basically, I think you have two choices. You could call this non-diagnostic, benign salivary gland tissue only, or you could call it potentially non-neoplastic. Well, in this particular case, um, I think according to the Milan system, non-diagnostic would be the choice. Um, and you could put a description, benign non-neoplastic salivary gland elements only, a note would be appropriate. Clinical and radiologic correlations are needed since the FNA findings do not explain the presence of a discrete mass. Repeat FNA or tissue biopsy under radiologic guidance may be useful. In clinical follow-up, the patient did have CT-guided tissue biopsy that revealed adenoid cystic carcinoma. The patient had radical parotidectomy with facial nerve sacrifice, which was performed. So here's the issue, and that is, if you have an aspirate that shows benign salivary gland elements only, benign non-neoplastic salivary gland elements, in the presence of a defined mass, either clinically or radiologically, those aspirates should most likely be diagnosed as non-diagnostic. It is possible if you had, for example, you don't have a defined mass, there's vague enlargement, and there is an FNA performed, and you get benign salivary gland tissue, it is possible that that could be representative and you might consider calling it non-neoplastic, but those would need um, an, a note or a comment warning the clinician that very close follow-up is needed because it may not be representative of the lesion. The other kind of salivary gland aspirate in this non-diagnostic category includes aspirates having non-mucinous cyst contents, such as shown here, where we only have um, histiocytes present. There's no epithelial component to indicate a neoplasm. The differential diagnosis includes a ductal cyst, a pseudocyst, or possibly an undersampled uh, cystic neoplasm. There are three exceptions to the non-diagnostic uh, rules. These uh, exceptions, these would not be called non-diagnostic, include aspirates that have cytologic atypia. You would put this into the AUS category. Aspirates with abundant tumor in matrix like this that looks like it's from a pleomorphic adenoma, and this could be put into the neoplasm category. And aspirates that have mucinous cyst contents, and we'll come back to this shortly, but this uh, case, you can exclude a mucopidermoid carcinoma, and this would be placed into the AUS uh, category. Let's move next to the non-neoplastic category in the Milan system. This is for specimens lacking evidence of a neoplastic process. These will include inflammatory, metaplastic, and reactive conditions. Um, also, reactive lymph nodes would fall under this non-neoplastic heading. Um, clinical and radiologic correlations are essential to ensure that the specimens classified as non-neoplastic are indeed representative of the lesion. And a subset of these um, aspirates classified as non-neoplastic will ultimately need surgical excision to exclude the possibility of a poorly sampled neoplasm. So let me give you a, a, a case, um, an FNA case example. This is a 35-year-old woman who presents with a left preauricular nodule, which is confirmed by her primary care physician on palpation. A one centimeter left parotid gland mass is detected by CT, an FNA of the left parotid mass was performed in the FNA clinic. Here are two images of the FNA. What we can see in the lower right is that we have a mixed population of lymphocytes, predominantly small mature appearing lymphocytes 
and a background of blood. Here we have a cluster of these lymphocytes. Again, it's a mixed pattern, but predominantly small, mature appearing lymphocytes. Here we have two other images. This looks like it might be a, a, a fragment of a germinal center, so maybe a lymphohistiocytic aggregate. And here we have a tangible body macrophage, as well as uh, some background mixed uh, lymphocytes. No real uh, atypia is detected in this uh, FNA. Um, we triage material on this case, as would usually be uh, the case, for flow cytometry. And the result of the flow cytometry um, was that it was benign. So what is your FNA diagnosis in this case? This would be diagnosed generally as non-neoplastic, consistent with a reactive lymph node. This is a very common salivary gland FNA where we have reactive lymph nodes associated with the parotid gland that are FNA'd and we get a diagnosis of non-neoplastic. You might put a note that corresponding flow cytometry is negative for a lymphoproliferative disorder. If, I also like to mention on these cases, if clinical suspicion or if lymphadenopathy persists, then additional tissue sampling would be indicated. And that's just in case um, there is a subdiagnostic lymphoma of some sort, possibly maybe a subdiagnostic Hodgkin lymphoma. So you, these patients definitely need uh, clinical follow up. And this patient, as is often the case, uh, their lymphadenopathy resolved, and this patient was disease free um, for over a year. So, again, in the non neoplastic category, we'll often have aspirates of reactive lymph nodes where you'll see a mixed population of lymphocytes like we have here, tangible body macrophages and germinal center fragments combined with a negative flow cytometry. Sometimes you'll have aspirates of sallolithiasis in which you'll get um, background inflammatory cells as well as actual fragments of the stone, and you can diagnose these as non-neoplastic sallolithiasis. Also in the non-neoplastic category, you'll have various aspirates of sallolithiasis, including acute sallolithiasis, chronic sallolithiasis, or granulomatous sallolithiasis. And here is an example of chronic sallolithiasis. These are usually hypocellular aspirates. You'll often see cohesive basaloid groups that are fairly small, and you'll have background chronic inflammation. So moving on to the atypia of undetermined significance category, we felt that this was an essential um, uh, diagnostic category to include. We also felt that the AUS category is a category that we're all familiar with from the thyroid Bethesda system. And this basically represents a category where there's some form of atypia. It's too much for us to call it non-neoplastic because we're not sure if there's a neoplasm. We cannot entirely exclude a neoplasm, but not so much atypia or not so many features that we're sure there is a neoplasm present. This will represent a heterogeneous category. A majority of the, two, of the lesions in the AUS category will be either reactive atypia that's non-neoplastic or possibly poorly sampled neoplasms. The specimens in the AUS category will often be compromised, either air drying, blood clot, or just hypocellularity. And we would uh, emphasize that hopefully this AUS category would be, of limited, would be used in a limited way, so probably representing less than 10% of all of your salivary gland FNAs. So let me give you an FNA example of this. A 60-year-old man presents with a right parotid nodule. A 1.5 centimeter cystic right uh, parotid mass is detected by CT. An FNA of the right parotid, parotid mass was performed. And here we have two images. And uh, what we can see is that we have a lot of background sort of uh, mucoid material we have what looks like maybe a histiocyte and maybe a couple of inflammatory cells here. Here's another view showing again something that looks kind of like a histiocyte. And again, maybe a little bit of fat in the background, but also some mucoid material and cystic debris. And here's another image of that um, aspirate. So we really don't have any um, epithelial cells. We just have mucinous content. So what is your FNA diagnosis? And 
this gets back to that cis contents question. You could either call this non-diagnostic um, or AUS. And in this particular case, in the Milan system, we would recommend calling this AUS or atypia of undetermined significance. Predominantly mucinous cis contents. And then you could put a note. The differential diagnosis uh, includes a range of lesions, including ductal cyst and mucosal, but a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma cannot be entirely excluded. In clinical follow-up, this patient had a superficial parotidectomy with intraoperative frozen section that showed mucoepidermoid carcinoma. The final diagnosis on this case was a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, as shown here. And you can see where this cystic lesion, you probably would put the needle in and only get the cyst contents out. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is one of the major causes of a false negative salivary gland FNA. So um, the final diagnosis was low-grade mucoep, and it was completely excised, and this patient has been disease-free for over 11 years. So getting back to this issue, if you have cyst contents only, but they're mucinous like like this, you cannot entirely exclude a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and for that reason, we would place this into the AUS uh, uh, category. Here's another example of a salivary gland FNA that you uh, would consider placing into the AUS category. Uh, this is an aspirate where it's hypocellular. We have a few epithelial cells that are suggestive that this might be a neoplasm, and we also have a sort of crushed cluster of lymphocytes. It's really not clear from this aspirate if this is all you have. If you're really dealing with a neoplasm or not, we have, again, these rare epithelial cells and lymphocytes. And because it's indefinite for a neoplasm, we're going to place it into this AUS category. So you can see there are lots of different scenarios where an aspirate is indefinite for a neoplasm and would fall into this AUS category. Now let's turn to the neoplasm category. This is a very important diagnostic category in the Milan system, and it will represent probably a majority of salivary gland FNAs will be in the neoplasm category. And there's two subcategories. Number one, the benign neoplasm, which is reserved for classic benign salivary gland tumors. And this category will include conventional cases of pleomorphic adenoma, Warthin tumor, lipoma, schwannoma, and others. The second group under the neoplasm category has, has a higher risk of malignancy. Um, it will be called salivary gland neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential, also known as SUMP. Um, it will be diagnostic of a neoplasm. However, a diagnosis of a specific entity cannot be made, and a malignant neoplasm cannot be excluded. So let's talk a little bit more about the neoplasm benign category. So again, it's reserved for classic benign neoplasms, and that's because the risk of malignancy is less than 5%. We want to keep this risk of malignancy low, and therefore we're only going to include cases of neoplasms where we're certain cytomorphologically that they're benign, and that's because some patients, for various reasons, maybe they're not surgical candidates, or maybe because of the risk of complications, you know, nerve complications and others, the patient doesn't want to undergo surgery. So some of these patients may decide to be followed non-surgically. And again, this category will include classic cases of pleomorphic adenoma, and fortunately, this represents a majority of parotid salivary gland tumors, and we do a great job on FNA of making a specific diagnosis of most pleomorphic adenomas. It will also include classic cases of Warthin tumor, again, a very common benign salivary gland tumor where FNA is very accurate at making the diagnosis in most cases. It will also include cases of lipoma, schwannoma, and other uh, tumors. So let me give you an FNA uh, example, uh, a case example of neoplasm benign. This is a 40-year-old man who presents with a right submandibular firmness. The patient is shown to have a palpable nodule in the region of the right submandibular gland. 
A CT confirms the presence of a two centimeter circumscribed mass and an FNA is performed. Here you can see a, an air dried preparation that shows this metachromatic uh, staining uh, fibrillar matrix material with embedded gland myopithelial cells. Uh, in the lower right image, we have an alcohol fixed pap stain preparation that shows this very pale staining um, fibrillar matrix material. And we have these very bland sort of stellate and spindled myoepithelial cells embedded with this, within this matrix material. And here's another uh, image on FNA. This is alcohol fixed pap stain. Uh, we definitely, because this is a matrix producing neoplasm, like to have both air dried and alcohol fixed. And again, it shows classic features of uh, a matrix producing neoplasm. What is your FNA diagnosis? And hopefully everyone looking at those images would know that this is a classic pleomorphic adenoma. And in Milan, it would be placed into the neoplasm benign category. And this patient went on to have a su superficial um, salary gland tumor excision, um, either parotidectomy or in the submandibular gland, they would have submandibular gland excision. Um, so it was a pleomorphic adenoma completely excised and they were free of disease now for four years. Here's an example um, of a neoplasm benign um, of Worthen tumor. And uh, this is an aspirate that contains our oncocytes our background cyst debris, as well as chronic inflammation. So this is the classic triad diagnose, diagnostic of a Worthen tumor. And again, we do a great job. We're very accurate with diagnosing Worthen tumor in salivary gland FNAs. So now let's discuss the neoplasm sump category. Uh, this is a very important category in the Milan system. So, this is a category where it is diagnostic of a uh, neoplasm. However, a diagnosis of a specific entity cannot be made. Also, a malignant neoplasm cannot be entirely excluded, and that's the reason we put it into the sump category. The risk of malignancy for this category is about 35%. This category will include many benign neoplasms, as well as some low-grade carcinomas. So um, we also, in the, in the Milan Atlas, um, have some subdivisions for the sump category. And these subdivisions include the cellular basaloid neoplasm, the cellular oncocytic or oncocytoid neoplasm, and the cellular neoplasm with clear cell features. And that's shown these subdivisions are shown in these two tables for the basaloid lesions and for the oncocytic lesions. Now, it's not essential that you subclassify your lesion that's placed into the sump category. These subclassifications are really only to help the cytopathologist by better defining the differential diagnosis for each of these different subcategories. So, for example, is it a basaloid neoplasm with fibrillary stroma? Does it have hyaline stroma? Does it have mixed or other stroma? Or is there no stroma present? And that can influence the differential diagnosis. Similarly, for the oncocytic subcategories, um, uh, is there a cystic background, a mucinous background, a nonspecific background? Is there granular or coarse uh, cytoplasm or vacuolated cytoplasm? Or is there significant nuclear atypia? And again, all of these things can influence the differential diagnosis for an oncocytic lesion in the sump category. So let me give you a case example. This is a 45-year-old man with a six-month history of a 3.7 centimeter enlarging left parotid gland mass. An MRI showed a nodular, slightly irregular lesion with variable signal intensity located in the superficial parotid gland, just lateral to the facial nerve, an FNA was performed. And on the FNA, we have these crowded groups of cells that have this basaloid or sort of immature quality. That is, they don't have much cytoplasm, they're mostly dark nucleus. And there's a little bit of matrix material, little matrix droplets in between these cells. So it's a basaloid matrix producing neoplasm. 
These are both alcohol-fixed tap stain preparations. This is a liquid-based preparation here in the lower right uh, that, again, shows this sort of non-specific crowded group of basaloid tumor cells that are fairly bland. Here's an, a high magnification view in an alcohol fix preparation showing that we have these very bland basaloid cells. There are two populations, the smaller, darker population with higher NC ratio, and these larger cells that have a little bit more pale cytoplasm. So what is your FNA diagnosis? Using the Milan system, this would be placed into the neoplasm sump category, and you can put a description. It's a basaloid neoplasm, and the features that I showed you are suggestive of a basal cell adenoma, but then we put a descriptive note. The differential diagnosis of a basaloid neoplasm of salivary gland origin includes both benign and malignant basaloid tumors. So in clinical follow-up, in this case, the patient had a superficial parotidectomy, a frozen section was performed and also favored a basal cell adenoma, resection margins were negative. But the final histologic evaluation, as you see here, it does indeed show a basal cell tumor. However, it's not shown in this image. There was focal perineural invasion, and therefore, rather than being a basal cell adenoma, this was actually a basal cell adenocarcinoma. But again, the management was appropriate um, complete excision with negative margin, and the patient in this case has been disease-free for over six years. So this is probably one of the most difficult categories of salivary gland FNA, and that is FNA of a basaloid neoplasm. And that's because there's a lot of overlap between the basaloid neoplasms, and especially if you're dealing with cytomorphology alone, uh, it can be impossible to distinguish between them. We'll talk about some ancillary studies that you can use in a few minutes that can really help you to sort out some of these basaloid tumors. But on cytomorphology alone, the differential diagnosis includes things like basal cell adenoma, um, cellular pleomorphic adenoma, as well as basal cell adenocarcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. Another lesion that would be in the neoplasm sump category would include any of the pleomorphic adenomas and this is probably less than 10% of these, where you may have some atypia, some marked cellularity where you don't have the classic uh, uh, matrix, or where you have metaplastic uh, uh, changes present. Here's an example of a pleomorphic adenoma that has extensive squamous metaplasia, and because of this, it would be placed into the neoplasm sump category. So the, the take home message is, even if you're dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma, if it's not a classic pleomorphic adenoma that you're sure um, is a benign example, and it has any of these atypical or metaplastic changes, it's probably best to place it into the neoplasm sump category. Let's discuss now the suspicious for malignancy uh, category in the, in the Milan system. This is a very classic uh, a diagnostic category that I think we're all uh, familiar with in cytology. This is for salivary gland aspirates, which are highly suggestive of malignancy, but for some reason are not definitive. Oftentimes, salivary gland aspirates in this suspicious for malignancy category will represent um, high grade carcinomas um, with initial uh, sampling that's limited. Um, or there may be some other limitations, so you can't get entirely to a malignant diagnosis. So here's an FNA case example. A 69-year-old woman presented with a slowly enlarging two-centimeter non-tender parotid gland mass, an FNA was performed. And what we see in this FNA, um, in these two images, is that we have um, actually a fairly classic appearance for what this neoplasm is. This actually shows a biphasic population of cells. Here we have these very cohesive, honeycomb-arranged ductal-type epithelial cells. And in the background, we have all of these stripped nuclei and cells with very delicate, clear cytoplasm representing an epithel a myoepithelial component. Here at higher magnification, you can see these ductal epithelial cells surrounding what looks like this proteinaceous material and then these are all myoepithelial cells with abundant pale 
um, cytoplasm that's very fragile. Here's a higher magnification view showing a lot of these myepithelial cells. Many of these have stripped nuclei, and we have this concentrically laminated proteination material. So what is your FNA diagnosis? You actually have two choices in this particular case. Um, this may not be the best example for the suspicious form of malignancy category. However, it does present fairly classic features of a biphasic neoplasm that's suspicious for epithelial myopithelial carcinoma. However, it, I think also um, neoplasm sump would be another alternative classification for this particular tumor using the Milan system. In clinical follow-up, this patient had a superficial parotidectomy. Frozen section also favored epithelial myopithelial carcinoma, and the exa examined margins were negative. And the final diagnosis, as you can see in this histologic image, is epithelial myopithelial carcinoma. This is another example of a tumor, an aspirate, um, that might be classified as suspicious for malignancy. Um, you can see in this aspirate that we have features that look very much like classic cribriform adenoid cystic carcinoma. We have basaloid tumor cells. However, they're very, very um, uh, smear. There's a lot of smearing artifact here, so it's really hard to appreciate the cytomorphologic features of these um, of these epithelial cells surrounding this cribriform looking acellular matrix globules. So, cytomorphologically, this is very suggestive of adenoid cystic carcinoma. However, in the absence of clinical information that you have nerve involvement, and in the absence of material for ancillary studies. Um, we can't be sure it's adenoid cystic, and therefore suspicious for malignancy is probably a good place uh, to put this uh, particular aspirate. So let's move now to the uh, malignant category. This is for aspirates which are diagnostic of malignancy. And we should subclassify these aspirates into specific tumor types when we can. And we should also try, when we can, to, to grade the cancer as either low grade or high grade. It's not always possible, but sometimes it is. Grading, as I've already mentioned earlier in this talk, can be very critical for guiding the clinical management. In addition uh, to these uh, salivary gland primary uh, carcinomas, other malignancies such as lymphomas, uh, sarcomas, and metast metastases would also be included in this malignant category, and they should be specifically designated. So let me give you this uh, FNA case uh, vignette. Uh, we have an 80-year-old man who presents with right facial paresthesia. Um, again, remember, nerve symptoms are very concerning for carcinoma. And the patient has a three centimeter right parotid gland mass, an FNA of the right parotid gland was performed under ultrasound guidance in the FNA clinic. And here on cytology, I have two images. Here's a pap stained uh, FNA, alcohol fixed FNA, and here's a diff quick stain air dried preparation. And both show these malignant appearing tumor cells that have very large, mostly round to oval nuclei with prominent nuclei and moderate to abundant. Um, oncocytic to eosinophilic cytoplasm. And you can also appreciate that here, these very large nuclei with prominent nuclei and abundant uh, cytoplasm. And here's another view of that. You can notice this uh, pleomorphism, uh, maybe a little bit of necrotic material within the background. Um, here's a, a, a cell block made from that particular uh, FNA. And uh, the cell block we did stains for androgen receptor and HER2 nu, which were both positive, and therefore hopefully everybody knows what this diagnosis is. This would be diagnosed as malignant, high-grade malignancy consistent with salivary duct carcinoma. And in a note, you can say that ancillary studies for androgen receptor and HER2 nu, among others, we always do a panel of markers, with, are, are supporting the diagnosis of salivary duct carcinoma in this case. And the cytomorphologic features in, in this case were really classic for what we would expect to see in an FNA of a salivary duct carcinoma. And on clinical follow-up, this patient had a total parotidectomy with sacrifice of the facial nerve and selective lymph node dissection. 
The diagnosis is salivary duct carcinoma. It was confirmed. Uh, unfortunately, the patient died of disease approximately one year later. And here you can see the, um, uh, the perineural invasion by the tumor. Um, there are lots of uh, salivary gland tumors that can be placed into the malignant category. Some of them may be placed into the malignant category after doing appropriate ancillary or molecular studies uh, in order to get a more definitive diagnosis. Aspirates such as this that show classic features of a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma can be called malignant. Here we have our epidermoid and intermediate cells admixed with this very crowded arrangement of the goblet-type mucinous epithelial cells in a, in a mucoid background. This finding is characteristic of, of a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. This is another example where our aspirate is clearly malignant. These are malignant-looking cells. Um, they're sort of could be placed in that small round blue cell category. Um, if you do your ancillary studies, you would uh, find that these are positive for CD45 and positive for B cell markers. So this could be diagnosed as a high-grade B cell lymphoma. So let me turn now and just say a, a few words about clinical management considerations for the specific Milan system diagnostic categories. And again, this is uh, information provided by Dr. Mark Vaveris, um, a head neck surgeon here at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. For the non-diagnostic category of Milan, um, repeat FNA, possibly with ultrasound guidance, uh, would be indicated. If the repeat FNA is still non-diagnostic, then cross-sectional imaging, if not already done, uh, would be indicated. If there are clinical concerns that warrant this, then some form of uh, surgical excision, so that there's extracapsular dissection, could be done. And if clinically not suspicious, then it may be okay to follow the patient with serial imaging. What about for the non-neoplastic category? What is the management? If clearly non-neoplastic, then the patient could be followed clinically and radiographically, but the clinician will be prepared to repeat the FNA if clinical picture changes in any way, including an increase in size, development of lymphadenopathy, or symptoms such as pain. For the AUS category, you would consider FNA possibly with ultrasound guidance. The patient would be followed with uh, regular clinical follow-up with cross-sectional imaging. And if there are any concerns for malignancy based on clinical findings, um, such as pain, nerve findings, history of cutaneous malignancy, you would consider excision through simple resection. For the neoplasm benign versus sump categories, and this is the same for the parotid and the submandibular gland, if unequivocally benign, then the patient either could be followed if they choose not to undergo surgery, or in most cases, they would have superficial parotidectomy or extracapsular dissection. If the diagnosis is neoplasm sump, you would have the same plan as above with intraoperative frozen section, that is surgical resection. If low-grade malignancy, no further resection. If intermediate or high-grade malignancy, um, the clinician would consider a total parotidectomy and elective lymph node dissection. What about the suspicious for malignancy uh, category for parotid? Um, they would have a superficial parotidectomy or extracapsular dissection with intraoperative frozen section. If low grade, no further resection. If intermediate or high grade, the clinician would consider a total parotidectomy and elective lymph node dissection. The same category for uh, the submandibular gland, um, excision with frozen section. If low grade, no further resection. If high or intermediate grade, they would consider elective lymph node dissection. What about finally for the malignant category for the parotid? They would have nerve sparing superficial parotidectomy when possible with frozen section to ensure complete excision. They would consider total parotidectomy depending upon the grade. Nerve sacrifice would be considered if unable to separate the tumor from the nerve um, or if the nerve appears infiltrated or non-functional. They would also consider a level two through four neck dissection and they would consider defect reconstruction during the surgery.
for the submandibular gland in a malignant category diagnosis on FNA. The submandibular gland uh, tumor would be excised at a minimum, and they would consider a lymph node dissection of levels one through three or four, depending upon the grade of the tumor. So the last thing I wanna say in just the last couple of minutes is a few words about ancillary studies, um, because these can be used to help us improve the accuracy of our salivary gland FNA. Um, so there have been important improvements in immunochemistry and molecular testing over the last 10 years. And these can all help to make the Milan system and salivary gland FNA in general more effective. And I think it's critical that if you're doing a salivary gland FNA and you have a specimen, that you should make sure that you, whenever you can, acquire material for adequate um, ancillary studies to be performed, especially in difficult cases. Ancillary studies can be uh, performed on salivary gland material by immunocytochemistry um, on liquid-based or smears or immunohistochemistry on cell block. The cell block is what we prefer in our lab because we have uh, controls that are based on formalin-fixed paraffin embedded material. You can also do molecular testing with FISH, with RT-PCR, or with next-generation sequencing. Here's a listing of some of the known molecular uh, changes in, in various salivary gland tumors. Um, these are very important, and molecular testing can play a significant role in helping to diagnose some of our salivary gland uh, FNAs, as well as small biopsies. Mammary analog secretory carcinoma with ETV6 gene rearrangement. Pleomorphic adenoma with PLAG1 or HMGA2 rearrangements. Clear cell car carcinoma with EWSR1 rearrangements. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma with mammal 2 gene rearrangements. Cribriform adenocarcinoma, as well as uh, 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 polymorphous adenocarcinoma, um, often will have PRKD rearrangements. Adenoid cystic carcinoma with MIB rearrangements and basal cell adenomas with uh, uh, CTNNB1 uh, mutations. And these are just three different uh, images of fish analysis contributed by Dr. Um, Garcia from the Mayo um, showing what can be done to detect some of these uh, molecular changes in aspirates of various salivary gland tumors. Here we have adenoid cystic mucoepidermoid carcinoma and secretory carcinoma. And this is a, a table from uh, Dr. Winnick's chapter 10 of the Atlas, just showing some of the immunohistochemistry that can be used to help to distinguish some of the different salivary gland tumors. And here I've just uh, illustrated a panel of some representative immunohistochemical um, stains. Uh, here in the red box on the upper left, this image contributed by Dr. Jeff Crane. This shows uh, nuclear staining uh, with PLAG1 in a pleomorphic adenoma. Here we, in this middle panel, we have uh, strong diffuse staining with mammoglobin in a secretory carcinoma. In these two panels, we have strong staining for DOG1 and SOX10. This is from a, an acinic cell carcinoma. In this panel, we have strong diffuse nuclear staining uh, for MIB, and in this panel, we have strong diffuse membranous staining for CD117 or KIT, and these are from an adenoid cystic carcinoma. So we now have a lot of immunostains that can be very helpful. Again, we like to use a panel of immunostains that can be very helpful in uh, improving the accuracy of salivary gland uh, FNA as well as small biopsy um, salivary gland uh, sampling. So just to finalize, thank you very much for your attention. We look forward to implementing the uh, Milan system. Uh, we all hope that you will find it very useful to improve uh, the FNA diagnosis and reporting of salivary gland lesions. And again, thank you very much. I'll now turn it back to uh, Emilio. Thank you very much, Dr. Faquin, for that thorough introduction of the Milan system. Had a, we had a question from the uh, 
uh, YouTube audience. It's from Andre Luis Alves de Melo. Uh, he mentions, uh, is there any ultrasound clue in order to differentiate or rise uh, the grade of a suspicious or for a uh, uh, mucoepidermal carcinoma rather than a benign mucoid cyst? That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of uh, any good uh, imaging findings that can uh, discriminate between, uh, that necessarily could discriminate uh, in some cases between um, a, a benign mucinous cyst, such as a, maybe even a pseudocyst, from a, a, a very uh, um, well-defined low-grade mucoepidermic carcinoma. In some cases, however, the mucoepidermic carcinoma will show a, a, a more irregular pattern. Um, uh, oftentimes, there will be some um, uh, desmoplastic stromal response. And some of these features, in some cases, may be detectable radiographically, but not always. And, um, and, and so it, it is a problem. And um, uh, I think to be safe, um, I think anytime you have a celery gland FNA with, extent, with a lot of background mucin, that you really should uh, warn the clinician that they could be dealing with a mucopidermal carcinoma. Um, it may be unlikely, but most of these cases, the patient should go on and have these uh, surgically removed or at least very closely followed. Okay. I just wanted uh, to let you know that from uh, our Facebook audience, you had a quite a, an international audience. Uh, Dr. Fabiano Caligari was watching from Brazil, and um, Christina Zioga says hello from the George Papanicolaou General Hospital in Greece. And um, actually, there's one person watching from Taiwan, and they're saying, you know, it's one in the morning over there, but very happy to listen to Dr. Fakewin introduce the Milan system. That's terrific. <laughs> So it does not appear that we have any more uh, questions right now. I mean, if anything happens to come up on, on the Facebook chat or the YouTube chat, you know, I can uh, forward those to Dr. Fagan and we can post those answers on the, uh, as a comment on both Facebook and YouTube. And I just want to remind uh, our audience that today's lecture can be found at pathologycast.com as well as on the Milan Systems Facebook page, which is just simply at Milan System. Up next, we'll have Dr. Caligari introducing the Milan system in Portuguese, and that's on the 4th of December. And then uh, scheduled, we have Drs. Udano and Higuchi, who will be presenting Milan in Japanese, and that's on December 19th. Uh, more information on those and other upcoming sessions will be posted on PathCast and Milan system social networking sites. So we hope you enjoyed today's session, and until next time, thank you. Thank you.